Um, okay, hold it close. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I know the weather uh, got really bad the first briefing. It's kind of kind of cleared up a little bit. I don't know if we'll have any luck tonight or not for any observing, but uh, again, we have some great topics coming up here. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Michael Summers for being here today. Um, he is a professor at George Mason University, uh, part of the Astronomy and Planetary Sciences Department. He has, uh, my goodness, numerous degrees, uh, the, the latest of which is his PhD from uh, Caltech. Um, multiple bachelor's degrees, I, I know, including one which I thought was interesting, which was Russian. Right, right. And, uh, you know, it never dawned on me that I should mm. ask if <laughs> they plan to give the presentation in English or not. Uh, but it'll uh, be English this time. You yeah. know, okay, it's in English. We'll so do it next I, time I, in Russian. I got lucky on that one. But uh, uh, he's, he's also part of the co uh, investigation team for the New, New Horizons mission, which I think is just a fantastic uh, uh, um, uh, feat of engineering and science. Uh, having flown past Pluto and now Ultima Thule, um, he's he's lucky to to have been part of that team, and he's going to share some of his thoughts with us today. So, uh, with no further delay, uh, Dr. Summers. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, and and thank all of you for your patience. Um, I owe you an apology for being late, and I feel like I owe you an apology for the the weather. I've spoken here three times. And each time we've had a downfall of water, so uh, and it's gotten worse each time too. So I would, I, I would encourage you to ask someone else next year. <laughs> uh, no, I would, I would love to speak next year again. To, anyhow, so anyhow, yeah, right. So anyhow, um, I I've been incredibly fortunate in in my career to work on about fourteen and and a little bit uh, NASA missions. And the New Horizons mission has by far uh, been the most exciting, uh, the most wondrous, the most uh, challenging, and, and I would argue one of the most successful of all the missions that NASA has ever had to the outer planets. And um, when we passed Pluto, I thought that we were pretty much done, but we weren't. We proposed for an extended mission to go even further to fly by an object which was unlike anything we'd ever seen before. In fact, even at Pluto, the, the, the Hubble Space Telescope could show Ultima Thule as just a tiny point of light, no resolution, no light curve, no spectra, just a tiny point of light. And yet NASA was um, optimistic enough to, to let us go on, and uh, we were able to fly by this object on January 1st, just a few months ago. and. Um, to, to take a look at this thing that no one has ever seen. No person has ever seen before. In fact, we've never seen anything quite like it. And um, what I want to do um, is uh, to tell you a little bit about the, the, the mission. Uh, I don't want to get into the, to the engineering or anything like that. I'm not an expert in engineering. But I want to tell you about the science uh, of the, the New Horizons mission. I want to tell you a, a little bit about this, this zone of the solar system. That, that we're exploring, the, the Kuiper Belt, sometimes called the third zone of the solar system. And I want to explain why that's important. And so I'm going to do something a little bit different in this talk. I'm going to give you a little tutorial on how stars and planets form. And not so much with the aim of understanding stars and planets, but understanding the debris that's left over from their formation. And then I'm going to show you what we found, uh, both at Pluto and Ultima Thule, two sort of completely different objects, but yet both members of this Kuiper Belt region of the solar system. And they're incredibly different, just two, but there are at least 100,000 more out there. And we don't know if they're between those two in some sense or completely different than those two or what, but it, it sort of whets the appetite for further missions to go out there to see what else is out there in our own solar system. This is far before you get to other stars. and and uh, to see what they're like. So yeah, I just said this, I'm gonna go through these things. One thing I did wanna mention is that this is an early part of the analysis of the, um, the results from the flyby of Ultima Thule. We have less than 10% of the data back. Uh, it's so far away and the baud rate is so low <laughs> that it's gonna take us somewhat 20 months, maybe a little bit more to get all the data back. And so um, you, you learn patience 
in this work. Uh, you learn patience uh, plus. So um, I, I know not all of you are planetary types, so this is the, the orientation. Uh, here is your canonical picture of the solar system. You know, you got the Sun in the center, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the terrestrial planets in the interior. That's all I'm going to say about those. And then you got the giant planets. Um, you know, we used to call them gas giants, but we now know that's not quite true. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You've got a belt between these two types of planets called the asteroid belt. I'm sure you've heard about that. And then out here, far beyond... Um, uh, any of these objects is um, uh, Pluto, and uh, it's a uh, large moon Charon, which we knew about when we launched the um, uh, the New Horizons mission. We found out after launch we had uh, four more moons of Pluto that we could explore before we got th or when we got there. So that was a little bit of a bonus in itself. But Pluto is right at the inner edge of this belt that we call the Kuiper Belt. And, and that's the region that, that this mission was really focused on, to try to understand this third zone of the solar system, what's out there. We knew that there were thousands of objects. We knew that they were unusual. They weren't like the terrestrial planets. They weren't like the gas giant planets. They weren't like the objects in the asteroid belt. They were different. And, and we also had a pretty good idea that they were primordial. And that's a word I'm going to use a little bit later too because we think that that is some of the debris that was left over from formation of the solar system that was unprocessed. In other words, it was fairly close to the original stuff that made up the planets. Okay. Now that doesn't end the solar system. There's more stuff outside of it, but I'm not going to waste time on that since I'm already late. Uh, but I, I'll go right into talking a little bit about the, the mission itself. Um, this is a, a this was a mission that was first conceived after the Voyager missions passed uh, Uranus and Neptune. Um, we realized at that point that that we had explored the NASA had explored all the major planets of the solar system except for Pluto, and there are all sorts of of, of reasons for that. So in the late the mid to late 1980s, we start we. Uh, uh, informal group of people started getting together and talking about the possibility of going further. Of course, there were all sorts of, of challenges. Um, you know, we needed new technology, we, we needed um, uh, political backing, we needed funding, and all sorts of things. But it wasn't until around 1999 that we really got NASA to consider this as a, as a mission. There's a very interesting story in how um, this was a mission that was born and died and born and died four times before we actually got it, um, got the funding to, to, uh, to launch it. We launched ultimately uh, January 19th, 2006. Um, the fastest spacecraft to ever leave the Earth. Uh, it had to be fast. We went directly into uh, an escape orbit from the sun, from the solar system. Uh, because we wanted to get there fast. Uh, obviously, it's a long way away, uh, just uh, in terms of, of numbers that you can wrap your mind around a little bit. You, you know how fast light is. You, you learn about it in, in school, and these are, you know, I'm sure you're all astronomy nerds. You know, it takes like a second and a half for light from the moon to get to the Earth, eight minutes from the sun. Well, it takes four hours for a radio signal to get from Pluto to the Earth, and the same speed as light. So it's very far away. We had to have a very lightweight spacecraft, you know, mass, energy, power, all those things are at an incredible premium when you're going so far away from uh, the Earth. We had to, to uh, go through a, a rigorous and painful decision on what instruments that we could take. Uh, we had a list of about 20 we would like to have taken, but we just couldn't do that. Of course, you always have to take cameras. you got to show the public uh, where you went and what you spent their, their billion dollars on. But we did have you know, two cameras. We had uh, ultraviolet spectrograph instruments to, to, um, uh, to measure the solar wind, the particle environment, the magnetic field, and so on. So we had enough for a reconnaissance, and that was what we considered this mission, a reconnaissance mission. And we had just the bare bones mission that we would need to do that and that we could fit into the, uh, the funding envelope and the energy envelope and, and power and all that stuff. Uh, we did fly by Jupiter to steal a little bit of Jupiter's momentum and that sped up the mission by two years. 
Well, we actually slowed we, 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 we slowed down Jupiter just enough to speed up the spacecraft so we got to, to Pluto two years before we would have otherwise. Okay. Now, Pluto, and I'm sure you've seen some of these pictures before. And I, I want to, to highlight just a couple of things because this is a Kuiper Belt object. This is one sort of in member or one sort of extreme type of Kuiper Belt object. Again, 100,000 of these things out there. We've seen two, incredibly diverse. This is a world. I, I mean, if you don't want to call Pluto a planet, um, you've got a lot of arguing to do. Now, I know that that's an argument that you hear in public, but it's a world, whatever you want to call it, however you want to define it. It is a world that is complex with active geology and active atmosphere. It's got a climatic system that's incredibly interesting and complex at least as complex as anything that we've seen in Earth history. It has glaciers, nitrogen, ice, glaciers. The first one we saw was this thing Sputnik Planum, a couple of square million kilometers, or a couple of million square kilometers of, of nitrogen ice, the stuff you're breathing, is solid there because of the low temperatures. It's not actually a solid, it's more like thick uh, toothpaste, something like that. But it's not a gas is the point. And it's a it's a, it's, it's a world with a complex history. And as soon as we started seeing these pictures, we knew that it was complex and an ongoing history because Sputnik Planum is smooth. You can see that in an image like this, no asteroid impact craters. That right there sets an upper limit for its age of about a million years or so. Uh, we refined that more recently, and now we think that the age of this surface because of processes that are going on is less than 100,000 years. You know, a blink of an eye in planetary history. We see it's had a complex, catastrophic history as well, because we see things like mountains that have been thrown up in, in some sort of explosion, bunched together and pushed around to the side, and these are mountains of water ice, okay? It's water, H2O, but in an ice form. And these are mountains a, a few kilometers in, 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 in height above the, the background here. You also see, you can't see it in this picture, but this dark stuff is reddish uh, when you look at the colors in a little bit more detail. In fact, it has the same type of reddening that we see in processed organics on Titan and Triton. It's a complex type of organic material. And there's a lot of that stuff out there on Pluto. And you see, if you look carefully, that some of it is layered on the sides of the mountains. And when you try to reconstruct this, you can see that, that that's an indication that Pluto has gone through episodes of an atmosphere that's thick, an atmosphere that's thin, and, and back and forth. So it has a complex atmospheric history, which we call a climate change type um, history uh, as well. Uh, at times, we think that the surface pressure on Pluto has gotten to be up to about 40% of what it is in this room. That's a pretty thick atmosphere for something that is a, a planetary body uh, smaller than our moon, okay? We, um, and here, this picture is, is not true color, but you can see the reddishness of the material that's embedded in these ice cubes. We saw things that were just bizarre. This is something that we called, initially we called it snakeskin terrain. Um, this is looking down on a region close to the Terminator, uh, day-night region, or the boundary between the day and night on Pluto. And these linear sort of shaped features or ridges that are very narrow, probably 100 meters across, or a couple times that, maybe 500 meters high. So they're very narrow, long, going for several tens of kilometers. And these are methane ice crystals. These are crystals but made out of methane ice. How do you produce something like that? We have ideas, but it's still generally a mystery. And one of the biggest discoveries and I would argue the most important one at this point is, is this. This is a cryovolcano, an ice, a cryovolcano, an ice volcano, if you will. Everyone knows how volcanoes work on the Earth. You have deep underground in the mantle of the Earth, 
a, a, a semi-liquid, which is melted rock, and it's under high pressure, and it, at those high pressures, the, the magma forces its way up through cracks and fissures and will explode onto the surface. And as it does that, it will build up mountains. Well, a perfectly analogous thing happens on Pluto. There's a liquid deep underground, under pressure, that forces its way up through cracks and fissures and explodes onto the surface, solidifies and builds up a mountain, and that, that liquid is liquid water. Liquid water inside of Pluto. And our estimates are now there's as much liquid water inside of Pluto as in all the oceans on Earth combined. Now, to have liquid water, you've got to have heat. You know, energy, liquid water, organic materials, all the things you learn about in elementary school that you need for life. You know, I never in, 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 in any time in graduate school would I have thought that I'd ever be thinking about even talking about life on Pluto. Such a bizarre concept, but yet there, you, there we are. <clears throat> we saw dried up lakes. This, this feature right here that looks like an upside down shark's tooth was a lake. And you can see how it evaporated and the, the, the beaches receded until you were left with something like a frozen ice rink. And we're not quite sure what that liquid was, but there was a lake on the surface of Pluto. And this is not ancient either. This is recent in planetary history because it's smooth. Things in the solar system don't stay smooth when it's exposed to all the cosmic debris that hits it continually. My specialty was the atmosphere, or is the atmosphere still? I'm still trying to figure this stuff out. And when, when I saw this picture, I, I mean, it's one of these things that you, you're almost embarrassed to tell anyone. Tears came to my eye when I saw this picture. I was at a, a, a wedding when this picture came, came down, and we had everything set up so that wherever we were, we could see the, the images come directly through the, the pipeline, and we could look at them with our, our cell phones, and I was sitting next to my wife when a friend of ours was getting married, and I saw this picture. I was looking at it, you know, like you watching a game, football game or something, and uh, I saw this picture, and I started crying. And my wife just reached over and started patting my, my leg. She thought, you know, this was a very moving moment for our friend and everything. I never told her, okay, <laughs> that, it, that it was about this picture of the atmosphere. You know, you spend 20 years seeing numbers on, on, a, on a printout. And here it was. This was the reality of, uh, of an atmosphere, and a bizarre one at that. These layers are layers of hydrocarbon, crystals, again hydrocarbons, complex organics that are formed by the simple process of sunlight breaking up methane and triggering the formation of complex hydrocarbons that condense onto these particles which grow and sediment and fall onto the surface. And we're pretty sure that that is the dominant mechanism for producing the organics on the surface. Most of them, not all of them. So I, I, like I said, I wanna get through Pluto pretty quickly. Um, because I want to get to Ultimate Thule Lake, because that's the, the, the I, I think, the new stuff that you probably haven't heard about, or at least not much about. So, um, one final thing about Pluto, and that is the darker regions. The, the brighter regions stand out, but sometimes the things that you don't see can have more significance. And in this case, this dark region here, Cthulhu Regio, is a region that is covered by water, and thick uh, deposits of more organic materials. Now, I words to, used a word earlier called tholin, and that's a, that's a um, uh, generic term for processed organic materials. We take things like methane, expose it to ultraviolet radiation or cosmic radiation, and over time, it will break up the methane and you'll get progressively more carbon-rich materials. If you go on long enough, it turns red and then black and then it becomes looking like charcoal or something like that. This has, this region here, you know, maybe 10 million square kilometers, has more carbon per square meter on the surface than you'll find in the Amazon forest. Okay. Again, carbon, you know, a central element in the formation of life. So all sorts of interesting things. I mean, by the time we were leaving 
you know, the Pluto region, where we could look back and see pictures like this. Just a few days after the flyby, we were already just stunned at what we had found. And this is just one of those 100,000 or so objects that are out there. So we knew we wanted to go on to see something else. We weren't quite sure that we were going to be able to because we were, we were out of money. It would have to be an extended mission. And so we did propose to NASA for that. Um, we asked for 120 million, something like that. We got 84. So we really had to do this on a bare bones uh, basis. Uh, but we, we did. And that's what, where Ultimate Thule comes in. Now, now, this is where I want to do just a little bit of a pause. Do I have to still end at 6.30, by the way? Okay, can I go to 9.30? Is that? <laughs> that was sort of a joke. Sort of. Um, no, I'll, I won't make it too long. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit more of the details about this part of the solar system. Not the kind of stuff I would normally put in a in a talk for the public because I'm going to show some figures and stuff that that have uh, numbers and have to has a little bit of interpretation. So if you were to take a computer program, in fact that's what was used to do this, and plot where all the known Kuiper Belt objects are, and look at a projection down in the solar system, it would look a bit like this. Inside you'd have the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And out here, you would have this region we call the Kuiper Belt. Pluto, just on the inside edge of it. And um, you can see that it has structure. It's not spherically symmetric. It's not radial symmetric. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things. And one thing that I want to show you here is that when you look, well, actually two things. When you look at the, just a histogram of the, of the distribution of Kuiper Belt objects with distance from the sun, you see that it really does look like a belt. This is distance from the sun in units of the average sun-earth distance, or astronomical units. The main belt is about 30, between 38 and 50 astronomical units from the sun. And so it really is confined to a narrow region of space. Now, if you break that up into two populations, one, the, the, the objects that are very close to the plane of the ecliptic, that are not inclined to that plane. Then you get one population. If you look at the ones that are highly inclined, you get another population. And they're very different. And you can see, and you'd see that here in the colors. The red, which seems to be much broader, is in fact broader. You have the, the, red, the, the objects that are highly inclined are spread out much further in space. Another way of seeing that is this figure. Same type of thing, although here I add one more parameter, and that is the inclination itself. So here is the distance again. Here's where Saturn is, Uranus, Neptune. This is Pluto, 40, 50 astronomical units. And all these dots, the different colors, are the Kuiper Belt objects. But when you plot it like this, you can see clearly there are different populations. There are some that are congregated here at low inclination, some that are high inclination, some that are right there at the same semi-major axis distance from the sun, but that are spread out over inclination. These are in a resonance with Neptune. That's why they're trapped there. But we see that there's clearly two different kinds of objects there, those that are very close to the plane of the ecliptic and those that are scattered outside of it. Now that's one of the, the big motivating things for the mission to Ultima Thule, is because the, the objects that are very close to the ecliptic um, have probably been formed right there where they are. The ones that are spread out further in space, we call them the scattered component, are most likely objects that have been scattered into that region. Now, um, now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how stars and planets formed. Okay, a little bit more technical, but I want to show you why that is important. Okay, so you look at a galaxy, you see star forming regions, and you know all about that probably. The, in, you know, oversimplifying it, the large regions that are very hot 
uh, large giant molecular clouds where they're coalescing to form new stars, star forming regions, much like the center of the Eagle Nebula. Everyone is in the world, I think, has seen this picture or one of the versions of it, where you see globules of stuff that has fallen together to, to start to initiate the, the collapse that give you new stars. Now, of course, when it collapses, it has energy and momentum. So as it collapses, it not only heats up to give you a new star eventually, but it rotates faster because of conservation of angular momentum. Ultimately, you'll get, I'll just skip on, you'll get a rapidly rotating pancake of material that in the center is what gives you the star. The disk of the pancake is what gives you the planets. And then the stuff that's not incorporated, not swept up by the gravity of either one of those, the stuff that is left over, that's the stuff in the Kuiper belt. Okay? But how do you get two populations of that? So we have to go in just a little bit more detail here. So you can think of it like this. This is a cartoon. You know, hot in the center. This is the proto-sun. As you move outwards, it gets, co it gets colder as you get further away from the sun. At some point, you will get far enough so that it's cold enough so that ice, like carbon dioxide or methane or water, can condense. Inside of that region, inside of what we call the ice line, you can only condense things like rocks and metals. This line tends to be somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. So if you look at it in that sense, a very simple sense, proto-sun, disk of material, the hot stuff that is condensing here is the rock and metals. Again, oversimplified greatly. This is what ends up forming the terrestrial planets, which are rocky and metallic. Out here, outside of the ice line, you get trillions of small objects that are condensed versions of rock, metal, and ices, because all three things can condense. Okay, so these tend to be simpler than this in that sense. Uh, of course, nothing of it is really very simple. All the things that we think of as volatiles in our solar system, like water, the things that make comets, all of it formed in the outer part of the solar system. And I mean, that's part of it. The other part is that the stuff that we see in planets, and this is no surprise, you look around you, you'd have a hard time finding any rock anywhere in Virginia that's older than a billion years old, right? And yet we know the Earth is about four and a half billion years. You can't find any rocks on the Earth that are four and a half billion years old unless they didn't come from the Earth like meteorites. And it's the same way with Mars and, and, and Mercury and, and the Moon. None of these objects have have primordial material because everything has been processed. On planets, much of it was processed very early on at high temperatures because of the infall of material that converted the kinetic energy to thermal energy and, and created planets that were mostly molten in the inner part of the solar system. Okay, so primordial, that was one of the goals, finding something that was that was the, the first stuff, you know, the, the original stuff that formed the solar system, unprocessed. And then we also have to explain the fact that there are two populations of that primordial stuff. A portion that is right at the plane of the ecliptic, very close to the orbit of all the other objects, and the scattered component. Okay. So, <clears throat> should I ask for questions or you want me to keep going and have it afterwards? You want to get to the punchline, I know. <clears throat> so, we, there are many lines of evidence, at least a half a dozen, that, suggested, that suggest that our solar system went through a reorganization right after it was forming. Not so much the sun, but the outer planets. So, if you were to look down on the sun as it was forming and the disk of material out of outside the orbit of Neptune, you would have seen a disk that looks a bit like this, and, it, and, and a lot of the material would be, com would be confined um, between Neptune and, and, and some other region further out, probably. Uh, but anyhow, that's, that's kind of irrelevant. And then if you look back 
100 million years later, you would see that everything had expanded. Sun again, Neptune further out, and all these objects here that were coalescing, forming small protoplanets, they would be in a ring that was further out. Okay, So something happened to push all this stuff outward. At the same time, it appears that Jupiter moved inward toward the Sun, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune moved outward from the Sun, and as it did so, it took all this debris that was left over and either gobbled it up by its gravity or swung it in the interstellar space or just scattered it just enough to get it into the Kuiper Belt. Okay. So what you end up with in the Kuiper Belt out here is a population of objects that were formed there and stayed there, a population of objects that were thrown out here or scattered out there, and then a few other sort of stranglers, you know, kind of irrelevant at this point. This population of objects, we call them the cold, classical Kuiper Belt objects, that's what Ultima Thule is. Unprocessed, original objects. So what, what is it? What did we find? Go over all this stuff, go over the name, everything. Again, from Earth, this was the best we could see. So we were wide open for speculation. There was one thing that we did, or at least a group of the team members did, before the encounter is that, that um, the team bought about 20 18 to 20 inch telescopes and set them up in different regions of the Earth to look at a stellar occultation, Ultima Thule. And by setting them up over a wide geographical region of several hundred kilometers, you could get a stellar occultation from different points, get different chords of the occultation, and build up a picture of what the projected shape of Ultima Thule is. Well, when that happened, and here, this is a picture of the chords, you see that it wasn't a round object. I mean, if you think of it as two objects, that would fit the bill, or it could have been something that was really long like that. So we already had an idea that it was an unusual object. It wasn't round. And I'll just get to the punchline. And this is a picture taken right when the, the first image came in that showed us that it was really clearly a dumbbell-like object. This is what it was. It was this binary object, clearly two objects stuck together. And initially, they looked very much just like spheres. Uh, the newspaper, some of them called a snowman, although here it's an upside down snowman. And it, since this was January 2nd or 3rd, it's kind of an appropriate time for thinking about snowmen. But um, you can see it's an unusual object. It doesn't look like anything else we've seen in the solar system, with one exception, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. The size is small. This is not a planetary scale object. It's about 30 kilometers in, in the long dimension and about 20 to 24 in, in the, the width. Okay, so it's a smaller object. Much bigger than most cometary nuclei, but there are, there are some that are larger and there are asteroids that are larger as well. But it's clearly odd for many reasons. Okay, and I'll tell you a couple of those in a minute. If you want to explain this outer region of the solar system, it was pretty clear that just that those two questions were not all the questions we wanted to ask. Okay? By looking at this, we could see that the primordial stuff was a little bit more complicated than what we expected. The fact that we see two of these things stuck together probably means that there were trillions of these objects in this outer region of the solar system when the planets formed, they were moving about very slowly relative to each other because if they weren't, if they came together and hit each other, they would just explode at each other. So they had to collide at a, at a speed which is about typical walking speed, maybe a couple of meters per second, nothing faster than that. So there had to be trillions of these things out there. And here we are, we were fortunate enough to, to find one. So what is, it, what, what is the comparison that I meant? If you, I don't know if you remember the Rosetta mission, some of you I'm sure do, um, found, or, or found a very unusual core for Comet 67P. And it has sort of a shape that's somewhat reminiscent of this, okay? Two lobed, barely connected, 
But this is in the inner solar system. This is something that has been processed. It most likely, we think now, was originally a two-lobe system that has lost a lot of material by evaporation because it's closer to the sun. So it's not completely unprocessed, but maybe the shape is indication that the inner solar system had a lot of these as well, a lot of the smaller objects as well. The difference in size, though, is quite remarkable. I'm not sh quite sure what that means. Uh, it could mean that there was just a broad distribution of sizes. But that's not the only one. If you look at P. Halley, it's bilobate. Borelli is long, and there's 67P, and here's Ultima Thule that I mentioned. Now, uh, that's part of it. And here I just wanted to show you the, um, the comparison of the size with other um, asteroids. It's not an asteroid, but just in terms of sizes, this is, the, this is what, uh, what uh, and actually the, the, the reflectivity on this is a lot lower too, so it would, look, it would look darker than these two. So an unusual shape is not that surprising in, in the sense that you know, two objects coming together. But now, how do you get those two objects together, okay? And how do you explain the features that we see on them? Because it's not all just a dull gray object. I haven't shown you any of the color yet. Um, let me go back to the other one and show you the picture of the... Bear with me a moment. Yeah. When you look at this, the more you look at it, the more things that, that begin to look puzzling. It appears as if there are other units that are round that look like chunks of things that might have come together to stick together. In fact, if you look carefully, it looks like maybe there are several of these things that have come together like pieces of dough, okay? Um, but when you look at the spectral properties, it's very uniform. The consistency, the size of the particles, the reflectivity all seems to indicate that it's similar material. Maybe it's chunky, of, maybe it's made up of chunks of stuff that came together, but again, that's kind of a mystery. But what is that thing right there? And then what is this bright feature, which we call the necklace, okay? Because it's bright, it really is about three times the albedo of the darker material around it. What would lead to material here becoming brighter than everything else? I mean, we went through lots of different possibilities for that being predicted you know, the, the shadow of the two objects shielding it from cosmic rays, particles breaking off and falling into it when it collided and so on. Nothing quite seems to work. Gravity might be the best key to that. And this is where I have to go back now to this one. Because if you look at, well, I'll do both of them at the same time. When you look at the, the local gravity versus the local slope, what you tend to see is that the local gravity is going to be the strongest, closer to the strongest mass. So if you were just going to calculate the, the surface gravity or the direction, the gravitational force at each point, it'd be somewhat uniform here, somewhat uniform here, and lower in the middle between the two because you've got stuff that pulling things apart. And if you look at local slope, though, you see, tend to see a region where you have very sharp slopes in between the two. So whatever it is, we think that it's related to the slope being very sharp right there in that interface between the two. Could it be pieces that have broken off over time and fallen in? We're not sure. Okay, That was what we were thinking until about, I'd say, two weeks after the close encounter, the closest of the encounter. Then we started getting pictures that looked a little odd, and we realized that we had been deceived. Okay. Yes, again, go back. Looks like two round things sticking together, right? They're not round. We were really fooled by this optical illusion. It, and you can't see it too well here. But as we got, if you, these are images just stacked as we get closer and closer. Far out, we get close, closer, closer. Right there, it looked like two round things. And then as we pulled away, we started seeing it edge on. It's like a propeller. It actually looks more like a propeller. 
Our best result now is that this is the shape of it. They're not even round. How do you make things like this? That's a big puzzle. I finally came up with a mechanism for that last week and I sent it out to the team and I haven't heard a word from them yet. It's either really stupid or really good. So we'll find out Monday, hopefully. So anyhow, <coughs> we don't know even what causes the shape at this point. Pretty, uh, pretty surprising. And then the other thing, and this is another thing I've been trying to, to, to find some time to think about, is that it's incredibly red. It's redder than Mars. Um, it's as red as Sedna. This is, this is not true color. But the redness is telling us something as well. I think that that redness is telling us it's not completely primordial. Remember I told you about complex organics on Pluto? And that if you take methane and you progressively expose it to something like cosmic rays, the, the methane will trigger reactions that will make it progressively more carbon rich. And as it does that, it gets darker and darker and becomes red and then eventually black. This appears to have the kind of color that would be expected if it started out with a layer of methane and maybe acetylene and that was exposed to cosmic rays for four and a half billion years. Now it was interesting that that result came out right around the time that the Spitzer announced that they had found uh, hydrogen cyanide and acetylene in the uh, disks that were collapsing to form newly stars and planets. The very objects that came together to form the planets already had complex organics. That has a lot of implications for astrobiology. So, okay, I'm, I'm way out of time, but um, we, we did have a hard time saying goodbye to it. That was our short little goodbye image. Not, not too impressive, but, you know, at six billion miles away from home, what can you say? So, anyhow. So, what did we accomplish? I mean, it, you know, NASA came up with a, a travel brochure. They always do this after a, a flyby just to kind of have some fun with it all. We made this first reconnaissance, which was an incredible challenge. Um, I'm astonished that it worked, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable even saying that now because I didn't think the mission would work early on because of all the problems we had. So, I was a little bit pessimistic, of course, because in public, everyone was, oh, yeah, we're 100%, you know, gung-ho, and it's going to work. We're sure of it. Privately, we were all petrified. It did work, and it worked spectacularly for Pluto and for Ultima Thule. We have about 14 kilograms of fuel left. We could do it again if we find another object that out there that's on the way without, you know, much of a delta V required. We could do this again. The problem is that we're so far away now from the sun, it would be hard to find a candidate to fly by. Not impossible but difficult. So we made a reconnaissance of Pluto and we saw a world that was more complex, more bizarre than we ever expected. And we knew it was just one member of this 100,000, or this field of 100,000 objects out there. So we wanted to do something completely different. We flew by one that was smaller. We fully expected it to be completely uninteresting. Just a rock, turns out not uninteresting at all. It's, a, it's the first look, at not something that's out there now, but really something that was out there four and a half billion years ago. Our first look at what the, 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 the solar system started out as with a little bit of maybe cosmic ray processing to change its color over time. Um, so what's next? Well, like I said, we may be, well, no, we are, I'll tell you the truth. We are putting together proposals for another flyby. We've got to find the object. We also are, um, uh, I guess at this point, putting together concepts for follow-on missions, orbiters and landers on Pluto. The most uh, interesting ones, I think, are ones that would uh, explore maybe a dozen Kuiper Belt objects, a single mission that would land or you know, go by maybe Pluto, put a lander on Pluto about the size of the coffee cup, uh, it'd be a lander and a rover, put a you know, something like a CubeSat in orbit around it, then go to another Kuiper Belt object, do it again, and explore maybe a dozen to 14 uh, Kuiper Belt objects. Um, last week, I was 
even thinking about having one that would a mission that would have a 50 year lifetime. Um, of course, all solid state and you know, propulsion and everything where you would explore every year a different Kuiper belt object. But even then you would see 50. Our indications at this point is that each one is going to be unique. Just like we learned that the planets in our solar system are each unique, it looks like each of these 100,000 Kuiper belt objects out there, even though our statistics right now are still pretty small, looks like they're unique as well. Okay, thank you, and again, I apologize for being late. <clears throat> So, okay. Let's, uh, let's fire away. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, Pluto is somewhat mm -hmm. unique due to its yeah. size for mm -hmm. a hyperbolic object, but is there reason mm -hmm. to suspect, at least statistically, that Ultima Thule is more typical of them? Can you repeat the question? Uh, is Ultima Thule more typical of the Kuiper Belt objects than Pluto? Is that yeah. fair? Okay. Um, we don't know what typical is. That's the problem. Um, we have spectra of a couple of thousand. And a few of these, a few dozen, we have um, light curves. And we, we know that many of them are not spherical. Many of them are, have satellites. Um, some are red. Some um, look like they have a spectra of um, uh, silicates. Some basalt. Some ice. Uh, methane ice and carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide ice. I don't know what typical is. I don't think we have enough information, quality information at this point, to define an average. But it's a very good question. Yeah. So you, you gave us a little bit of a teaser. Do you have an idea of the shape, why the shape is the way it is? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I should have said that. Ah, uh, should I or shouldn't I? You know, that's that age-old question. I can give you a clue. Okay. Sorry, I'm just dying to share this. I'll give you a clue. I'm going to show you a picture, but I'm not going to say anything about it. Does anyone recognize that? <coughs> nope. Looks like a dumpling, doesn't it? Okay, let me give you another one. You're, you're saying that these, this might be uh, typical? This might be typical? Now, explaining the shape, the question is uh, explaining the shapes of, um, of the uh, objects that come together, that came together to form Ultima Thule. These have the names, Pan, Atlas. Um, they look like dumplings. You know where these are? In the rings of Saturn. And there's a bunch of them there. Remember I told you that the outer planets rearranged? When they rearrange, there's a lot of stuff that collides and explodes and is distorted and pulverized. The outer planets had huge rings, probably a thousand times bigger than Saturn's rings now, early in solar system history. It was really a catastrophic place. I mean, there were lightning strikes that went on for 10 AU in early solar system history. So out there, there could have been a lot of these formed around larger planetary bodies, slung out to the Kuiper Belt region with everything else. Sure enough, they stick together. If there are enough of them stick together. They stick together on ends. That's the way they will come together with their most stable, the lowest energy configuration. And there you have it. And it explains a lot. It explains how you get a center roundish thing in the middle. It explains why there may be you know, details of ruptures and asteroid impacts all around it, but the 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 stuff on the outside edge is um, smooth of the same uniform consistency and roughness. You don't see major units. I think I'm going to shut up now. Sorry, <laughs> but anyhow, yeah. So who who was next? I think up here. Uh, the 
solar system mm. history now is mm. so different than envisioned in the mid yeah. 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is the connection? Well, the the reality is that the more we look at anything, the more we see that it's more complex than we thought. So I have no problem at all with recognizing Jerry Carper's work by naming it the Carper Belt. No problem at all. In fact, I'm happy to do that. The fact that it's more complicated than he anticipated, that should not take away from his accomplishment at all. Yeah. You mentioned that the solar system reformed at some point. Well, one is dynamical, but we know that a lot of interesting things happen. Like you remember, Uranus is tilted over at like 98 degrees. Okay, there's that. The fact that you have this scattered population out there of objects that should have been formed in close to, to you know, between Mars and Jupiter. There's another aspect of it. But dynamical models seem to uniformly predict. There's, in fact, there's a variety of models called the NICE models, or NICE models, however you want to call them, that predict that this would happen early in the formation region because forming the giant planets where they are now is hard to do. Okay, well, that's part of it. No, I don't, I don't know how you, well, you know, I mean, I mean, look, Mercury had a collision that stripped off its crust. It's mostly a metallic planet. Um, Venus probably had a near collision that flipped it over and slowed its rotation. Mars probably had a near collision that formed the Tharsis bulge. The Earth had a collision with a Mars-sized object that formed our moon. I mentioned Uranus, tilted over. pluto Charon were formed in a collision. Planetary collisions were, were the norm early in, in the history of the solar system. Probably as many planets were ejected from the solar system as remained in the solar system. There were more rogue planets between the stars than there are planets bound to stars in stable orbits right now, just because of that complex chaotic nature of, of, of solar system and planetary formation. So collisions may have a lot to do with the limitation on the growth of inner solar system objects. The further out you get, the, you know, the larger the volume and the less likely you have collisions. I'm not sure we know enough, though, to set limits on that ju just now. The one thing I would keep in mind about exoplanets is that our observations are highly biased according to what our technology can give us. We see objects that are big, that are close in, uh, because that's what we can see. We're now pushing that envelope to finding objects with longer orbits like the Earth and smaller objects like the Earth. We don't really know at this point what the average exoplanet is going to be. It looks like it's Earth size or maybe a little bit bigger than our size, a super Earth in other words. But it may be as we get more and more data, the average ends up being half the size of the Earth. I don't think so, but it could be. We don't know. So I'm not sure we can answer. It's a good question. You know, why didn't our solar system produce one super Earth in the inner, you know, inside the orbit of, of Jupiter instead of four moderate-sized planets um, as opposed to what we have now? I don't know. I, I'm not sure we know enough. Good question, though. Of course, yeah. I, I mean, it could be that our current solar system looks nothing like what it did after the first set of planets formed. Possible. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the reddish one? That one. Okay. Oh, that's good enough. But you talked a lot about accretion and collisions, <coughs> but was, did anybody theorize that that actually could have been a particle on top, the, the small snowman ball, that was stretched off of and popped off of where the ring is and ultimately left that indentation on the top? And this? Yeah, we're, we're really limited in, well, 
our imagination is not limited at this point. We can dream up all kinds of scenarios. It's a very good point because there are things that we can imagine that are plausible, physically realistic, physically plausible to happen, given what we know, but we can't say whether or not it did occur because we just don't have enough information. I think I have that. Those kind of questions um, I haven't dealt with, to be honest with you. I mean, I've heard people talking about them, but I don't feel comfortable repeating. I don't feel comfortable knowing enough about what I've heard to explain it. Um, but like I said, there are plausible ways that you can see this thing forming and evolving that we don't have enough information to rule out at this point. Um, but something forming, parting, and coming back, that's not probably in the cards. Not parting, but actually not separating the cards. Completely? Yeah. You would have to really fine tune the dynamics to get that to happen. I mean, I, I just don't know. Which one? Uh, a lot of times really the um, uh, more red, 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 more reddish, more reddish, uh, that, that one. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm seeing, and you may have already explained this and maybe somehow I missed it, mm -hmm. but what, I, what I'm seeing is the lighter parts mm -hmm. of it, and I'm seeing the, the necklace, as you were talking about, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, could those be from different impacts or different where you're seeing underlying material? And maybe, did you say the dark was more organics on the top? And well, <clears throat> I, I did go pretty fast, and I sort of jumbled a lot of ideas together. The reddish, general reddish, what I think, that's probably due to the fact that you have a lot of cosmic rays and maybe ultraviolet radiation hitting methane ice that's generally uniformly mixed throughout the stuff and giving it a reddish tint. Okay, Now, the colors that you see, the color gradations that you see, the fact that you have a light thing right there, a light thing right there, it seems like most people are, are thinking about those in terms of dynamical origins. Okay, In other words, this, maybe that's crystals that, that broke, at, broke apart when the thing came together and hit. I don't know. Maybe that's a possibility, but I, 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 I just don't know enough to say. <laughs> I mean, a lot of things I could speculate here, but I just don't know enough. Oh, one more. Is it? Yeah. Yep. The, the recent um, uh, interest in finding fewer craters than expected mm -hmm. on these bodies. Do you have any comment on them mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. the um, of the uh, ability mm -hmm. of these uh, surfaces to smooth themselves out? You're talking about Pluto, right? Okay, me. Uh, well, yes and yes. Um, the the um, the picture of Pluto with the 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 big glacier, Sputnik Planum. Sorry, I didn't realize I'd gone through so many slides. Here we go. I'll give you a really good one up here. There we go. This one. Okay. One thing I'll say is that we now believe that this entire region is an impact crater. Okay probably about the size of Hellas Basin, or at least of the same character as Hellas Basin on Mars, a very large protoplanet that hit it at a glancing angle. Because it was lower, we think that a lot of the nitrogen ice has built up in this thing. We think that it is, the ice is dynamical and evolving because there's heat keeping it from freezing solid. The heat is coming out of the interior. Now, I haven't shown you pictures of this in more detail or more uh, uh, at a finer resolution but you can kind of see a lot of lines here that break this up into small polygons what we believe now is that these polygons are convective cells the top part of a convective cell we have heat underneath in the interior of Pluto we don't understand the mechanism that generates it but there's heat keeping the water liquid of course it's at higher pressure but it's still keeping it a liquid and it's also coming out of the interior as diffusive thermal diffusion and convection right here. So there's heat from the interior that's coming out through 
bubbling convection right here, just like boiling water, but it's much slower than that. As far as I know, that's the only mechanism that will keep a large region like this smooth. Okay, it's got to be continually resurfaced by a, by something that won't that doesn't hold a lot of, of structure above an average mean height. But there were, uh, I was talking about the last few weeks, and uh, where I think it was Sharon and Trudeau, possibly even the two of you were saying the absence of cratering has changed uh, views about uh, the amount of material out there. Uh, oh, absolutely. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's a more general conclusion looking not just at Pluto, but at all objects that, that we, in fact, we think that there, there were fewer smaller objects, this is the recent result, uh, in the Kuiper Belt region than we thought before, okay? And that's just due partially, but New Horizons studies, you know, looking away from Pluto, you know, looking at other Kuiper Belt objects that are distant. Um, I don't know the answer. To that, but it, it does appear to be consistent with an absence of that scale of impact craters on the on the objects that we can get crater densities. Okay, that is different than this. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>